Here we are, 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be looking at only two verses, verses 9 and 10. And we're looking at a man by the name of Demas. So beginning at verse 9, reading verses 9 and 10, Paul writes, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. I was mentioning to uh, our first service today how that uh, those of us who live in this area are familiar with the uh, city San Dimas. Perhaps I have some of you who, who live in San Dimas. And uh, you probably know the origin of the name of your city. Perhaps you don't. I actually was interested in why they would name a city here called San Dimas because what you have here in verse 10 isn't real flattering. Demas has forsaken me. So I thought, why would you name your city after Demas? I mean, it's like calling yourself, you know, San Judas. I mean, why, why did you do that, right? And so San Dimas is actually, was intended really to be named San Dismas. Dismas is the traditional name of one of the thieves on the cross who came to faith in Christ. But when they made San Dimas, they made a mistake and called it San Dimas rather than San Dismas, and that's how you got the name of Demas in your city. That's all. Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> but with that, Demas. Let's look at the life of a man by the name of Demas. Let me give you an introduction. At this point, Paul began to conclude his letter, and he's making final requests. What is interesting is that though he is facing his own execution, he's beginning in its conclusion to focus on, on two basic things. One, he is focusing on, on people, and second, he is focusing on his own spiritual needs. Now, as it pertains to people, Paul knew that the gospel message that he declared would produce various responses. And we know that to be so. You see, some who hear the gospel who embrace the message of salvation through Christ. They hear the message as it's given the good news, the news that includes the forgiveness of sin, peace with God, the promise of a new life, and they openly and they gratefully receive his gift of life. And as a result, because they got saved, they're, they're overwhelmed with the joy that comes from knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you have a relationship with God. It's like what it says in Isaiah 12, verse 3, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. They've been set free. They're, they're born again, and uh, they're so blessed that they receive that message. They're like the man of the Gadarenes who was set free by the Lord Jesus Christ, a man who was horribly demon-possessed. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came to that that region, he delivered him of his de demonic possession, and, and this frightening demonic man uh, was delivered. And, and in doing so, in his deliverance, he had drawn people's attention. It says in Luke 8, 35, they went out to see what had happened, came to Jesus and found the man with whom, uh, from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind seated there at the feet of the Lord, clothed and in his right mind. And, and these are people who received the Lord, and, and they, like that man, are now clothed. They're, they're clothed with the garments of righteousness, like it says in Isaiah 61.10, where it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with the jewels. They're clothed in righteousness, and now they're in their right mind because God set them free. God changed them. For the first time, they're beginning to think clearly. The salvation has impacted them. They cannot keep Jesus to themselves. Like the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, they begin inviting people to come to Christ in John 4, 28, verses uh, 4, 28 through 30, it, it reads, The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. 
So they're like that. They're saying, Jesus revealed my life to me and gave me an answer, gave me a promise for uh, living water. Can this be Messiah? Inviting friends, clothed in our right minds. And so these people receive that message. They respond to it, and they're grateful. God set them free. God changed them, and they're thinking clearly. But others hear the message of the gospel, and they reject it. They have no interest in anything that God has to offer them. They hear the message, but they harden their hearts to it. They reject it. For whatever reasons they may have, they're not open to what God says he can do in that message. It reminds me of Zechariah chapter 1, verse 4, where God says, Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. It reminds me of what Jesus said to the city of Jerusalem in Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills a prophet, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Others reject the message, even though they may at first outwardly appear to respond to it. This rejection can sometimes happen over a number of years. They can be considered Christians, even ministers, for years. And then they turn away. Spurgeon once said, the raw material for a devil is an angel. The raw material for the son of perdition was an apostle. And the raw material for the most horrible of apostates is one who is almost a saint. So Paul closes, and as he closes, he mentions some who have embraced the message, and he refers to at least 15 of them, but we also see others who rejected the message to their own hurt. And we can learn lessons from both of these categories of people. So as we look at this passage, Paul is facing his execution. Paul is about to be beheaded. And as he's awaiting, his mind is filled with thoughts of those who have impacted his life. Considering this, he gives final instructions to Timothy to deepen his understanding of ministry. And he closes. And he closes by giving insights into the spiritual condition of certain men and certain women. But he also makes a, a request of Timothy. Notice what he says in verse 9, where he says to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly. So he makes a request to this young man. Paul is writing in a cold, damp dungeon, and he issues a final request to his son in the faith. Please come and see me before I die. I've been forsaken, and I desire your fellowship. When you face the end, what do you think might be your last thoughts? What do you think you might be concerned about in your last moments of life? Should you have opportunity to actually think and prepare? Do you think that your last days will be completed wishing that you had spent more time at work or that you had had a better job? Do you think that you will wish that you had spent more money on a better car or had nicer clothes or that you went on better vacations, lived in a better neighborhood? Will you wish that you had loved others more? As a husband, that you had cared for your wife more? As a wife, that you had cared for your husband more? As parents, that you cared for your children more? Will you regret not knowing Jesus or wish you could have been more faithful to him and were more loving to others and concerned about their eternity? For Paul, his last request was that Timothy would come and see him. His last letter closes with him telling Timothy that he wants to see him one last time. And his desire is fellowship. He wanted fellowship with his beloved son in the faith. You see, Paul had been abandoned by those who should have remained supportive of him. He said earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, all those in Asia have turned away from me. He says in chapter 4, verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. Key leaders had embraced bad doctrine, and they had abandoned him. And though he had tearfully warned the church, 
they still embraced the error. He had warned the elders of the church of Ephesus what would happen in Acts chapter 20. He had said to them in verses 30 and 31, from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. You see, when, when a minister like Paul and when other ministers sometimes will show emotion from a pulpit, there are those who are very uncomfortable with it. They don't understand why is this person doing that. As all of you know that I, I, I can open my heart and I, I can become emotional and there are those who don't understand why. I've actually spoken and taught at pastors conferences for many years and, and there have been times when pastors have not understood and have actually said, why is he getting tearful? Well, Paul did. Paul was there with the Ephesian elders and he was given last orders. He's speaking to them for the last time. Timothy would have been amongst them. And he said, listen, I'm telling you what's gonna happen in the church, what's gonna happen is there will be people who will infiltrate. They will come in. They will bring damnable heresy as they come in, but that's not it by itself. There are other things to be concerned because amongst yourselves, there will be those who arise up. They will draw disciples after themselves. He says, and please don't forget, I warned you about this for three years with tears. I've been concerned for you to the point of weeping over you. And though he had tearfully warned the church because of the bad doctrine that would enter in and that those would, they would embrace and all. Uh, he had tearfully warned the church and they still listened to what was being said. As we read about Paul's last instructions to the, to the elders, he warned them and then he knelt down and he prayed for them. And after doing so, they all wept freely. They held him tightly. Acts 20 verse 38 reads, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. So they loved this man, Paul, but some who wept because they would not see him again ended up abandoning him. Many had abandoned him, but Timothy hadn't. And Paul wanted to see Timothy. He wanted to see his son in faith one last time he wanted to encourage him to serve the Lord. And he knew that Timothy needed encouragement and he wanted to be a source of strength for him. You see, earlier Paul had made it clear that he desired to see him. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 4, he told Timothy he was greatly desiring to see him, being mindful, he said, of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. So he's simply repeating at this point what he's already said. And he's thinking of a son that has remained faithful but as he does so, he remembers a friend who has not. Notice what he says in verse 10. Demas has forsaken me. Paul mentions someone by name. And by saying this, it must have truly broken his heart. Demas, Demas has forsaken me. This would have surprised and shocked Timothy. Timothy knew Demas. Demas was someone that served alongside of Paul. And Demas was considered a friend. In Paul's writings, Demas is mentioned twice as an assistant in ministry. Philemon, verses 23 and 24 reads, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. In Colossians 4, verse 14, Paul writes, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So in mentioning him, Paul actually was showing him great honor. His name was being preserved for the entire life of the church. What an incredible honor that would be to be referred to as a fellow worker, to be known as a friend of the apostle Paul. Paul's life seems to have been a constant moving in ministry. He had very little rest. He traveled tirelessly. He ministered constantly. And the fatigue of travel, the drain of ministry would have made friendship more meaningful. To be able to share with others who understood his burdens was much needed. Not every Christian would have understood what Paul went through as a minister. A minister's life is not the same as those who are not in full-time ministry. There are concerns and experiences that are unique to him. And when you have someone who understands, it deepens your bond with them. You see, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about ministry. They think that they understand it because they're Christians, and perhaps they understand a certain element 
of it, but they don't understand it all. And you can't. Why would you? My mom used to say to me, if I said, you know, going through some things in church, my mom would say, oh, I understand. And I'd say, no, mama, you don't. And she'd say, oh, yes, I do, son. I understand. And I'd say, no, mama, you don't. She'd say, of course I understand. I'm a believer, son. I'd say, no, mama, you don't. And I'd say, let me, let me say this, mom. Let me say, if I told you I understand what it means to have a birth pang, what would you say? If I was with a woman who said, oh, I'm going through labor and I'm having birth pangs, and I sat there holding my stomach going, yeah, I get it, would you think that I did? And well, of course not. How could you? You're not experiencing that. I said, but it's the same. Mama, you say that you understand ministry. You don't. You're a Christian. You understand certain aspects, but you don't know what a minister goes through. You don't know what a pastor goes through. You don't understand those things. You can come alongside and help, and God bless you for you. You do that, but you'll never understand. You see, in ministry, it's a blessing to have somebody who knows what you're going through, who walks alongside of you, that you can speak to openly and honestly, who you can speak to and say, I don't think that I gave a good message, or I, I just, it's just a lot of burden right now, and that other pastor just will listen to you and will nod their head in agreement. They understand, and, and that was Demas for Paul. He understood. He traveled with him. He saw the things that Paul went through. He, he shared in some of the things that Paul experienced. He, he visited Paul in prison. Some believe that he actually spent time there. He would have known why Paul was in prison. He, he would have seen uh, what following Jesus had cost Paul. He would have known that Paul had given up everything to follow the Lord, and, and that would have weighed heavily on his mind. And then over time, Demas would become uh, a member of what is often referred to as an inner circle. It's a natural product of people exercising gifts and serving. Some move from simply being a part of the work to becoming a leader in the work, and Demas served. And he had the honor of traveling with Paul. He was admitted into the fellowship of church leadership. He is honored in the church. When, when Paul would mention Demas's name, to Timothy as he was reading this aloud to the church of Ephesus, the whole church would have a gasp when he says, Demas has forsaken me. The members of the church would gasp, Demas, Demas, we know him. Demas lived in close fellowship with believers. He was trusted, he was honored by them. When Demas would walk into a room, the people would greet him, the people loved him. You can almost picture him standing at a fellowship with the people. He's visiting with them. He's smiling. He's laughing. And some might be pointing and saying, hey, that's Demas. He's a good brother. You see, in the body of Christ, there are, there are men whose names are recognizable. If you simply mention them, if I say Chuck Smith, people recognize the name Chuck. If I say, oh, you know, Raul Reese, people know Raul Reese. If I say... Greg Laurie, they'll say, oh, he's a good brother, great evangelist. They'll, they, they know the name. You mention the name and people know him. If he walks into a room, people recognize him. And they might nudge one another and they'll say, that's Raul over there. Oh, that's Mike McIntosh over there. That's Don McClure over there. That's, that's and you name it. He's known. That was Demas. Demas would be in the room and the people would know him. They honored him. They respected him. They say, this guy's a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He, 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 he's well known. It's Demas. Greatly honored. They would have regarded him as a sacrificial co-laborer with the Apostle Paul. Remember, Paul wrote Philemon in Colossians while he was in jail. Demas was mentioned in both of those prison epistles. That means that for a good portion of his life, he was an openly professing minister of the gospel. He was seasoned, he was respected, he was loved, and he was honored, and he was welcomed as well as admired. Surely Paul would say something good about this man, but Paul writes, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Can you hear the tear? In Paul's voice. Can you hear it? It's there. Demas forsook me. 
You can hear it. Forsake me. He loved this age. He didn't rejoice, he wept. My friend, my companion, my fellow servant, I thought you were faithful, Demas. We went through so many things together. Betrayal, sorrow. Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present age, my beloved friend, my traveling companion, bailed. He forsook me. Like all those in Asia, Demas turned away. Demas had likely been with Paul in Rome during his first imprisonment, and now Paul has been imprisoned a second time, and Demas abandoned him. That gives us insight into why Paul would write, be diligent to come to me quickly. Because Demas left Paul when Paul needed his fellowship and his encouragement the most. When he says he has forsaken, that word forsaken means to desert. It means to leave helpless, to totally abandon. Paul was deeply disappointed in Demas because Demas had left him holding the bag. But notice why Demas left. Notice what he says, because he loved this present world. The Greek language has different tenses. And when it says he loved, the word loved there means he fell in love with. He fell in love with this present world, with this present age. He fell in love, he, he welcomed it, he entertained it, he was fond of this present age, he loved it dearly, he was well pleased with it. Demas was in love with his age, with this period of time. He, he didn't long for the age to come. Demas had come to believe that this world was all there was, all that would ever be, and he fell in love with it. And Demas fell in love with the present age, with its pleasures as well as its treasures. He had an incredible influence for the kingdom, but he hungered for the world. He was the opposite of Timothy. Demas rejected the gospel, and he rejected the apostle. His hunger for this world was greater than any longing for heaven or for the Lord. And Demas may be an example of a person whose heart is either rocky or thorn-infested soil. In Matthew 13, Jesus gave a parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils. And the sower we know is Jesus. The seed is the word of God, but the soil represents a human heart. And as he gave this parable, he spoke of various kinds of soil. He spoke of a soil by the wayside, which he described as hardened, doesn't receive the seed. He spoke of stony soil, which is shallow, produces quickly, but doesn't last. And he spoke of seed falling among thorns. And that represented seed that was choked out by cares, riches, and the pleasure of life. And perhaps this is what happened in the life of Demas. Seed was choked by weeds. Again, listen, he traveled on ministry tours, but he didn't love Jesus. He saw miracles. He heard solid teaching. He was a witness to God moving. It wasn't enough. He heard amazing testimonies, saw incredible sacrifice, but God hardened to it. What he ended up seeing was an old man abandoned in a jail cell with nothing to his name. He saw a man with nothing alone, without a cloak, begging for books and parchments. See, that's what Paul's going to say. Please bring my cloak. Paul was in an ice cold cell, a stone cell, abandoned by all and freezing. Please bring my cloak. Winter's coming. And that's what Demas would think of. He saw an old man with nothing. Now, that's not what Paul saw. In Philippians, Paul had written in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, I know how to live. I'm almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything with the help of Christ 
who gives me the strength I need. In Philippians 3, verse 8, he had written, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I may have Christ. You see, it may have been his exposure to the world as he traveled that drew him away. He fell in love with the temporary. He had no vision for eternity. You see, the world that we live in, even today, even as then, can offer many promises of pleasure and opportunity. This is a man who may not have traveled very much, may not have seen great cities or very many. And on his traveling, he's seen much. He's seen beauty. He's seen grandeur. He's seen a variety of things. I've had opportunity to travel. I've seen some of the great cities of the world. And I've, I've seen how beautiful they can be. I, I have seen Munich, I've seen Brussels, I've seen London and Glasgow, I've been to Paris, Vienna, Madrid, Barcelona, Athens, Tokyo. I've been around the world. I've been on the Champs Elysees there in Paris. I've seen the City of Lights. I've seen the activity, I've seen the people moving from place to place. I've been around the world. And I've seen the palace at Versailles. I've seen the palace uh, in Madrid. I, I've, I've seen a lot, a lot of museums, a lot of places. And I'm telling you, some of it is mind-blowing, as you know. From the beauty of a beach in Hawaii to the mountains of the Swiss Alps. Unbelievable beauty. And so many people going place to place. Seen it. Been there. Done it. But for Demas... The more he saw, the more he wanted. And to think of some old man without even a cloak asking for books as he's doing to Timothy, to think of an old man in a cold cell, and then to see the beauty. He said he fell in love with his present age. It may have been his traveling and seeing that contributed to his heart being swayed. You see, Satan used the allure of the world to distract, and he still de derails believers through it. The riches and glory of the world is a huge source of distraction to believers. The love of this world is often the cause of turning away from the Lord. <laughs> it's true in the case of Lot's wife. You read your Old Testament. She was delivered from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities surrounding it. They were told, don't look back, move on, get out. But she stopped with a longing in her heart. She, she looked back and was caught in judgment so severe that Jesus himself simply said, remember Lot's wife. Her heart stayed when her body was removed. Though she had traveled out of the city, her heart remained there and she was judged alongside of it. Jesus himself was tempted by Satan to forsake God and embrace the world. In Luke chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the devil said to him, all this authority I'll give you and the glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. The grandeur, the beauty, this has been delivered to me. I'll give it to you. I give it to whomever I want. Get behind me. You see, Jesus made it clear that believers need to make choices. In Matthew 6, 24, he said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So that gives us insight into what Paul has written in his first letter to Timothy. He had made it clear believers have to come to understand that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Timothy, teach him that. He had said in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, 
storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. You see, Christian believers are aware that our priorities are spiritual in nature. We are to seek God first in his kingdom and all these things shall be added to us. We look to him for our daily bread. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Somebody said, we do not find that he was frightened by the dangers that accompany the profession of faith in Jesus. Sadly, it was a love of the world that provoked this promising disciple to make shipwreck of his faith and good conscience. Even though he could scorn danger or endure severe hardship, he could not withstand the enticements of the world that seduced him with its pleasures. Now remember in verse 8, there's a promise there in chapter 4. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All who love Jesus ultimately receive this crown, and that desire motivates their lives because they love the Lord and desire to be with him. But Demas did not have a desire for Jesus. The desire of his life was the temporary and the eternal had no value. Again, somebody said the exact nature of Demas' forsaking Paul because of his love for the present system of things is not disclosed. Perhaps Demas' love for material things and worldly pleasures became stronger than that for spiritual things. Fear of martyrdom with Paul may have caused Demas to seek a safer place and thus preserve his life in the then existing system of things. In any event, when conditions became unfavorable, Demas failed to use his marvelous opportunity to strengthen his brother, Paul. It may be that he is part of the company spoken of in Matthew 7, where Jesus in verses 22 and 23 said it like this. He said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name, drive out demons, perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. He departed from Paul. He turned back to the world. It says in verse 10, he went to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a great and a rich industrial city. And that's where he went. Now, I should add that two others are mentioned along with Demas. You have Crescens, he went to Galatia, which is Turkey. And Titus went to Dalmatia, which is modern Croatia. They aren't spoken of a forsaking Paul. They simply went on ministry trips. But with Demas, it may be that he had made connections in Thessalonica, he sought out some rich friends. There's a great church in that city there. And the weirdness would have been that he would have been seen and recognized. And think of how awkward that would have been for him when a member of the church saw Demas doing whatever Demas ended up doing. Sometimes people will leave and they walk away and the don't want to be recognized. They don't want to be seen because they're embarrassed or ashamed. Years ago, we had a member of one of our worship teams, this is 25 years ago now, who had left and was angry and this and that. And Marie and I one day were in the Montclair Mall. Um, we men call the mall purgatory. So I was in purgatory in Montclair. And as Marie and I were walking, we were on the second floor. I looked across and I could see somebody walking in the same direction. And I looked, it was the woman who used to be on our worship team. I saw her and I looked at her and I turned to Marie and I said, that's so-and-so. But when I looked back in her direction, cause I was gonna wave at her, she had long hair. She had taken her hair and put it over her face and had her head down, acting as if she thought she could hide behind her hair. And I looked and I said, that's interesting, isn't it? She's hiding from me. I wanted to say peekaboo. No, she's hiding from me. 
you know, and sometimes people do that. Can you imagine that Demas? They saw him. They knew him. Almost like the apostle Peter. You were with him. I was not. That's Demas. But Demas, what are you doing here in Salonika? You know what's interesting about Demas? No mention is ever given concerning any restoration. We are left with the statement that he made his way to Thessalonica. Could he have repented? Could he have been forgiven? Yes. He could have been, but it's not recorded. I pray that he was. We're not told that. So we're left with a sad epitaph. Demas loved this present world. When my father died, it fell on me to determine what would be written on the headstone of my father's grave. And I put on my father's grave stone, Frank Corona Rosales, beloved husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. And I put a Bible verse, John 14, underneath his name, declaring my father a follower of Christ. When my mother died, I determined what to write on her stone that she has as we laid my mom side by side with my dad. And I said, a follower of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. What's going to be on yours? When, when, when my life is here, is ended, and I go to be with the Lord, I want my children to write on my epitaph, as my epitaph, a follower of Jesus Christ, faithful to the end, not he abandoned God not that he deserted God, not that he has forsaken God, but that he followed God. That's the kind of epitaph we should all want. What is yours going to be? What will be written concerning you? What will sum up your life so that when a stranger walks into a cemetery and looks down as they're looking for their grandfather, grandmother, or mom, and they're looking at the different and they see yours or they see mine, I want them to be able to see David Rosales, beloved husband, father, grandfather, follower of Jesus Christ to the end. That's what we're called to. I do not want it to say, having loved this present world, he departed. May it be he followed him to the last moment and is with him even now. What will be on your headstone. We need to determine that today. What's it going to be? Follower of Christ or forsaker? It's up to you.